All right, so let's keep going with our video lecture for chapter 19. We're in part number dos. And this is all going to be about the other two Islamic gunpowder empires, starting with the Safavid Persian Empire. So the Persian Empire, uh, this is going to be the smallest, the weakest, the poorest, I guess, of the three gunpowder empires. They're going to be centered right here. This is uh, what would we call Persia, modern-day Iran. And their capital is going to be, where is the capital? I forgot. Isfahan. Where the heck is Isfahan? Anywho. All right. So this is it. Uh, so this is, you know, part of the Middle East. Uh, you know, here we have Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Here we have Mesopotamia. Here we have the Ottoman Empire. Uh, here we have the, the Mongols up there messing around still uh, in Central Asia. Anyways, so the uh, Persian Empire, uh, notice uh, there's going to be a lot of disputed territories, right? They're going to be fighting quite a lot, to the, and mainly because they're in the middle of the other empires. Uh, so they're always going to be fighting each other, especially for Mesopotamia, right? Uh, a lot of conquests and fighting for Mesopotamia, and there's an obvious reason why. Right? Mesopotamia is the economic powerhouse, the agricultural powerhouse of the Middle East. This is the Fertile Crescent. This is the birthplace of civilization. All right, the Mesopotamians were the first civilizations on earth, right, because they had the farming before anyone else did. So the, um, the, the rich agricultural lands of, the, of Mesopotamia is going to be an easy target for people to fight over, especially the Safavids versus the Ottomans. So the Safavid Empire is going to be unique because even though it, it is an Islamic empire, it is not going to practice the more common version of Islam, which is Sunni Islam. They're going to practice the minority religion, which is Shia Islam. Right? So around the world, even to this day, about 80% of Muslims follow Sunni Islam, while only about 15-20% or so follow the Shia version. So in Persia, we see that Shia Islam becomes this really becomes the official religion, and they're going to start persecuting Sunni Muslims, right? So if you were a Muslim, that wasn't good enough. If you lived in Safavid Persia, you had to be a Shia Muslim, and even though they allowed, uh, they they were tolerant of Christians and Jews, even though those are like tiny, 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 tiny little communities in this empire. Uh, for the most part, the, the Shia Muslims uh, of the Safavid Empire, they're going to be pretty intolerant. And remember, this is the same exact place where the Mongols conquered and created the, uh, the Ilkhanate of Persia, right? which is the government that existed before, uh, before the Safavids. And the Ilkhanate of Persia was famous, not only because, you know, the Mongols messed up the, the economy with all their inflation stupidity, but it was also famous because they were persecuting non-Muslims. So there's already like a tradition set up, established in Persia, where uh, one religion was considered the right one and other religions were considered wrong. Now, Shia Islam, again, can be traced back to the conflicts about succession after Muhammad's death. Uh, the people believe that Muhammad's son-in-law, uh, his name was Ali, was the, uh, the only official successor, uh, the, and therefore he was the true leader of the faith, and Ali's descendants, Ali's uh, family, uh, should have been continuing the, that leadership role. Uh, instead of giving it to the Sunnis and the other caliphs. Uh, so the Shia Islam, 12 or Shiism, is the official is, uh, religion of Safavid Persia, right? Sunni Islam is banned. And of course, this is going to cause problems with the Ottomans because the Ottomans are not Shia, they're Sunni. And they're going to fight each other because of religion stuff. Plus, they're going to fight each other because of Mesopotamia, you know, where all the food stuff is. All right, so there's going to be a lot of fighting. Uh, but these people, again, they're going, uh, the, the Safavid rulers are going to, um, are going to be 
um, you know, of Turkish ancestry, um, and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna convert when they come to Persia, uh, and they're gonna be strong, strong supporters of the of the Shia Islamic religion. And even to this day, there's a lot of conflicts, right, between Iran and Turkey. Right, these are two major countries in the Middle East, two powerhouse countries, and they're always at odds with each other because each one wants to influence their neighbors uh, because each one thinks that their version of Islam is the correct version. All right, so they're still arguing about that even to this day. All right, so when like uh, Shia Muslims, when they go to Mecca, right, when they take the Hajj, that causes problems all the time because uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, where Mecca is currently at, most of the people there are Sunni Muslims. So there's always like that distinction between those two groups and it, many times it leads to conflicts. Right? A lot of the fighting and, and internal warfare we see within the country, modern day country Iraq uh, is because of sectarian violence between the Shia and the Sunni where they're fighting each other because that country is almost like split 50-50 Shia versus Sunni. So. Uh, a lot of these problems can be traced back, you know, to this time period, right? These modern-day problems can uh, have their traces, have their origins uh, with uh, the Safavids and the Ottomans. Now, the Safavids are a gunpowder empire. They are going to use the gunpowder technology that was passed down to them by the Mongols, uh, by the Turks, by, the, by Tamerlane. Uh, but, however, they're not going to continue kind of like improving their technology as much and they're going to keep you know using old traditional warfare like cavalry like charging on horseback and going into battle on horseback uh, and there's this very famous battle that was fought between the Ottomans and the Safavids and the Ottomans completely wrecked the Safavids right so the, the Safavids go charging on their horses with their swords out and then the Ottomans just open fire with their cannons and the Ottomans end up winning, right? Uh, and even though, again, these are all gunpowder empires, they're all established using gunpowder, uh, the Safavids didn't use it as much. And therefore, because they lose to the Ottomans and they realize that they are at a disadvantage, right, since they're fighting over and over uh, against the Ottomans, fighting for land, fighting for religious stuff, the Safavids are going to be more open to trading and working and learning with Europe, right? Because they, when they see what cool new weapons and technology the Europeans are going to come with uh, and start trading with the Safavids, right, they're going to say, okay, these weapons are cool. We can use them against the Ottomans. So the Safavids, especially the British, the Safavids are going to work closely with the British to develop their weapons so they can have more of a fighting chance against the Ottomans. Now, uh, each of these empires is going to have like this big, great leader. The Safavid em emperor, the famous one, this is this guy called Shah Abbas the Great. And Shah, remember, is the old Persian title for king of kings, right back to the Persian Empire of Cyrus the Great. And Shah Abbas is famous for a few things. Uh, he reforms the administration of the government, making it more centralized, making it more efficient, reducing corruption. Uh, he reforms the military by bringing in more modern, up-to-date, uh, you know, uh, state-of-the-art technology. Uh, and this is uh, made possible because he expands trade with the Portuguese, but mainly with the English or the British. Uh, this allows the military to gain more strength. He built this awesome capital called Isfahan. Um, and uh, so he's, you know, the great leader of the Safavid Empire. And Isfahan uh, at his time was this like magnificent capital city of Persia. Uh, lots of fountains and courtyards and parks and uh, mosques and palaces. So it means a lot of money must have been coming in for them to be able to spend it on building this awesome, awesome city. Now, when we look at uh, Safavids, of course, remember, uh, the Persians were one of the first people uh, in history to start using veiling, and that's obviously going to be continuity even to modern times. So there's going to be a lot of restrictions on women. Uh, they're not going to be allowed to uh, interact freely in society with other with men who are not, you know, their families. Uh, but remember, these people are still Muslim, and therefore, under Islamic law, that you know, women do have certain rights, like the right to inherit property and the right to divorce. 
but they had zero, absolutely no political power and no say in the government, uh, and therefore they were never considered, of course, equal. All right, the Mughal Empire is in India, um, and the Mughal Empire is going to be the richest of all of them uh, because they're going to be trading more than any of the other empires. So the Mughals were founded, were founded by this guy called Babur, and Babur uh, was a descendant of the Mughals, uh, sorry, of the Mongols. And his, his last name or the dynasty name he takes, the Mughal, is actually a Persian word for Mongol. Uh, so we see that, you know, he's kind of like claiming ancestry and connection to Genghis Khan of the Mongol Empire. Uh, so anyways, he is going to overthrow uh, the uh, Sultan of Delhi. Remember the Sultan of Delhi controlled northern India during the post-classical era. There were Muslims, there were the minority group in, in India, and uh, uh, it was very kind of like a decentralized, weak government. Uh, so Babur is able to, and his people are going to migrate into India, into northern India. They're going to overthrow the Sultan of Delhi, uh, and they're going to conquer northern India and then expand their empire throughout the rest of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, most of India will fall under the Mughal rule. Uh, and India is going to be, of all these empires, going to be the most multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multi-everything. Uh, because India is such a vast, diverse place. So, um, the Mughal Empire, and it was the richest one, and it was the best government. They had the best, best, best government bureaucracy or administration. Uh, it was super rich because it was the center of the Indian Ocean Trade Network. And remember, this is at the same time that the Europeans are desperately trying to sail across Africa or around Africa uh, or across the Atlantic to get to India because they want to buy cool stuff from the Indians. Right, from the Mughals. So the, uh, here we see, you know, the bottom, we see the picture of these British guys coming in and they're going to want to open up trade. All right. And remember all that silver that's being mined out of, you know, South America by the Native Americans, by the Incas, right? All that silver, a lot of it's going to go to India, making India super rich because India has cotton, India has spices, India has, you know, jewels and clothing and textiles and the Europeans are going to eat it all up, right? They love this stuff. And they're going to bring silver to pay for it. And um, so India, the Mughal Empire is going to be super, super rich because it's going to be a center of trade, right? And the, um, so the Europeans are going to tr trade directly with them instead of trading through the Ottoman Empire. Now, the great leader of the Mughals is a guy called Emperor Akbar. Uh, and it's not a trap. He's just called Akbar. So anyways, Emperor Akbar was this like uh, super strong military guy, uh, but he was surprisingly super religiously tolerant, right? And um, he creates this like super bureaucratic centralized government. Uh, he conquers most of India, um, but he is most famously known for being tolerant. Uh, he realizes that he is ruling a diverse, religiously diverse people. And therefore he realizes, he knows, it's common sense to him that he cannot impose Islam on these people because that's just going to stir up rebellion. So he opens up his government to Hindus. Remember, he's a Muslim, but the Muslims in India are the minority group right, 10, 15, maybe 20% at best. The vast majority of the people are Hindus, right, whether they're upper class, lower class, or middle class, most of them are Hindus. So he says, look, we got to work with the Hindus, right? And that's something that the Sultan of Delhi didn't really do well. You know, they ruled over the Hindus, but they didn't work with them. So this guy, he marries a Hindu princess, right, one of his many wives, he opens up the government positions, especially the high-ranking government official positions, to Hindus. Like, so if you're qualified and you're educated, it doesn't matter what religion you are, you could work for the government, right? He invites different religious leaders to talk to him, right? So he has meetings with Hindu leaders. He has meetings with uh, Jainists. Remember those guys, the Jainist people, the, the ones who don't want to do any harm to any living being? Right? He invites Christians, right? When the Europeans get there, 
where, and they come with Jesuits, he invites Jesuit missionaries to come talk to him. He doesn't convert, but at least he's so open-minded that he, he wants to learn about what the you know, European Christians have to offer. Uh, and of course he talks to Hindus and Muslims. And he even comes up with his new religion, right? He works on creating a new religion. He calls it the divine faith, right? And he tries to kind of like blend Islam and Hinduism together because he thinks that maybe he can unite his empire, his diverse empire, by mixing the two main religions of Islam and Hinduism. Uh, but it doesn't really work for him. But regardless, he, it shows how tolerant this guy was, that he wants to make it work. And the big, big thing he does is that he eliminates the Jizah tax. He says that the Hindus don't have to pay it. Now, of course, the Hindus should be paying it because they're not people of the book, right? And they're not Muslims. But he says, no, 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 religious freedom, no payment necessary, right? And this is, remember, this is crazy because this is the same exact time that the Protestant Reformation is going on in Europe. Right, where Catholics and Protestants are killing each other left and right, where the Inquisition is up and running and you know torturing and killing people because they're not Catholics. This is the same time where Native American culture is being suppressed, right? The Aztecs, the Incas, their culture is disappearing because the Spanish are destroying everything, claiming that it's the work of the devil. So this guy at this time in history is probably one of the most progressive, open-minded guys ever, right? Uh, and super, super smart. Now, they have a whole group of um, bureaucrats working in India, uh, and these are known as the Zamindars, and they're kind of like the Janissaries because they take on the same role, uh, and these guys, you know, they're tax collectors, they're law enforcers, they're, uh, they construct stuff, uh, like, you know, supervising stuff. Uh, so the Zamindars and the Janissaries take on the similar role, like bureaucrats. Uh, but these people are not kidnapped. They're not forced to convert. Uh, but they're loyal to the emperor. And they work for the government. Uh, but eventually what happens is when you have weak emperors, which, you know, empires always have, uh, they're going to grow corrupt, right? Because they're going to have so much independence in their job and so little supervision that they're going to start pocketing a lot of the money uh, and, and that's going to cause a lot of frictions and problems in the future of the uh, Mughal Empire. Now, just like there's great leaders like Akbar, there's going to be stupid-ass leaders like Aru Ganza. And this guy's a dumbass, right? Because he, he is super religious and super strict, and he says, look, uh, Hinduism is bad, so everyone has to convert. So he starts, you know, closing down temples and uh, forcing people to convert. Uh, he brings back the Jizah tax. He destroys temples and builds mosques. Um, and then he's the grandson of Akbar. So it's crazy how he didn't learn anything from his granddad. Uh, and the point is that he, by doing all this, kind of like he's picking a fight with the Hindus. And that's not smart because the vast majority of his people are Hindus. Uh, so it's going to cause a lot of friction and problems. So Arun is a dumb leader. Um, and again, the, some of the leaders like Akbar were smart and worked you know, together. Other leaders like Arun Ganzeb were dumb and you know, created frictions for his empire. Uh, and that's going to bring problems later on. We're going to see, uh, when we start talking about the decline of these empires, that's going to, you know, religious issues are going to be a big factor in the decline of these empires. All right, so that is it for part numero dos. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for learning. All that good stuff. I'll see you next time.